Hello students, today we will be doing the current affairs for both the 12th of March and the 13th of March. Okay, the first topic, uh, okay, out of all the topics that are there, uh, the most dynamic topics are the one nation, one election topic. We will discuss this a little bit more in detail because the Prime Minister himself spoke about it. Also, we will uh, talk about the registered vehicle scrapping facility. This is one of the entities which is there under the vehicle scrappage policy. We'll discuss about the vehicle scrappage policy as well as this facility for which the rules have been recently changed. And then we'll talk about the EPFO interstate hike um, and also India-Canada relations in detail. Uh, most of the other topics are pretty static topics. Okay, uh, moving on. Okay, one nation, one election. Why is it in the news? Because the chief election commissioner, Mr. Susil, Susil Chandra, has said that the election commission is ready to hold simultaneous elections or one nation, one election. Even earlier on National Voters Day, the Prime Minister during his address had raised the topic of one nation, one election and one nation, one voters list and had said that the continuous cycle of election results in affecting developing uh, developmental works. Even the Law Commission in one of its uh, earlier recommendations had spoken about this one nation, one voters card, one voters list. So that there is no difference between elections to the states and elections to the center. Okay. Now what is this thing? What is the problem with the current election system that we have? Currently, we have this system where you have continuous elections that are happening. You have state after state elections. You have state elections. And then followed by that, you have the general Lok Sabha election. And in the middle, if at all any of these uh, governments, they lose their uh, majority, or if at all they lose the confidence of the legislatures, then again the legislatures are dissolved and then there are again elections. So it seems to be that the entire nation is, a cont is in a continuous race of elections. And also you know that whenever, once the election commission announces the election date, after announcing the election date, the model code of conduct, it kicks in. And once the model code of conduct kicks in, no new significant policy can be announced or executed and this affects the developmental cycle of the entire country because continuously state after state there will be elections in some place or the other and there will be uh, parliamentary elections and yeah so that affects the development what are the other problems that are caused, uh, caused because of this continuous frequent elections there is a massive expenditure due to the conduct of multiple elections. For the conduct of every election, you, do you see the number of uh, places where the election commission has to spend money? Also, teachers have to be deployed. Also, paramilitary forces have to be deployed. You know, uh, there are so many of these exercises which are conducted by the election commission. Uh, then postal paper which has to be printed, ballot papers. There's a lot of expenses on the hands of the election commission. Also, apart from that, there is also a problem of the policy paralysis which we just spoke of due to the model code of conduct. And also there is an impact on the delivery of essential services. What are these essential services? These are services which we definitely need. But during the elections, like say for example, healthcare services. Okay, these are essential services. However, these tend to get disrupted during election period. Also, there is a burden on the manpower such as teachers, paramilitary forces, other government functionaries, the district administration and hence they cannot cater to the actual needs of the people. Uh, law, and order, law and order situations, they cannot take care of these law and order situations or the other administrative works that they are supposed to take care of. It also puts pressure on the political parties, especially the smaller political parties because whenever you have elections, it is not the bigger political parties who are affected. It is usually the smaller political parties because they need to try and increase their spending ability to match up to the larger parties. And that is the biggest problem. Also, uh, please do remember that election periods are periods of extreme incitement. There is a lot of hatred and there are a lot of provocative speeches. And this affects the unity of the society. And it affects the glue that binds the society together. It leads to communal clashes. It leads to caste-based clashes. And hence, election 
frequent elections are you know they are a big problem what are what is this idea of simultaneous elections that uh, the election commissioner has spoken of it is nothing but having the indian election cycle in such a manner so that the elections to the lok sabha the parliamentary elections and the elections to the state assemblies are synchronized together so that the election to both these can happen within a particular span of time if you have a period of 6 months and say that during the 6 months we'll have elections to both the lok sabha and the state assemblies that would make it a lot more simpler okay now what are the benefits of having these simultaneous elections you see there is a lot more governance that can happen why because the administration is not burdened the ruling parties will be able to focus on legislation and governance rather than giving in to be in campaign mode always also there is reduced expenditure of money and ad- and administration there is a continuity there is no breakage due to the model code of conduct also these populist measures which are announced every time there are elections these will be reduced no more populist it will only happen once in 5 years if you have lesser number of elections then the government doesn't have to do populist things also the impact of black money on the voters will be reduced as all elections are held at a single time and hence there won't be enough black money to keep uh, you know keep uh, kept there won't be enough black money to be spent during the elections because they're all being happen- they're all happening at the same time however there are also many challenges when it comes to simultaneous elections it is definitely a lot advantages but also please remember that india is used to this idea of having uh, different elections at different time periods now if you try to bring in simultaneous elections you'll have to bring in a lot of changes first of all you have to make amendments to several uh, articles of the constitution like say article 85 like say article 174 you know these actually expect that elections need to happen within 6 months after dissolving either of the assembly or the lok sabha now in case of simultaneous elections this cannot happen you cannot conduct you know elections within 6 months after the state you have to wait until the uh, time of the lok sabha or the parliamentary elections to conduct elections for all of them together it's almost impossible to achieve simultaneous elections in practice as assemblies might get dissolved at an untimely manner due to political realities what if due to horse trading or uh, some other reason legislators are resigning or some other reason uh, that the government loses a majority when it loses a majority you cannot hold elections to elect the new government why because you know the state has to wait until uh, elections can be held together now that is a big problem okay now if at all the pm or the cm advises the president or the governor as the case may be to prematurely dissolve the lok sabha or the state assembly and force a snap elections to gain electoral advantage this can't happen now by passing the no confidence motion against the government or defeating the government's confidence motion what if this happens the central government has misused its powers under article 356 what is this this is the president's rule now in case the central government dismisses the government of the state now will the central government be in charge of the state uh, till the next elections happen even the constitution states that the central government can only you know head the states or be in power in the states for one year not beyond that okay there are caveats to this but it is only for one year so how will you adjust it you'll have to make a lot of changes in the constitution also according to article 85 and 174 like what we discussed you know elections have to be held within 6 months and this is not feasible if the elections are held only at fixed durations also if elections are not held within 6 months it would be a travesty of democracy why because then without having elections there will be unelected people in power and that is not what democracy is about also frequent elections mean that politi- politicians are answerable to the people and they are accountable to the people if at all some political politician has taken a wrong decision or if the lok sabha has passed a bill which is not in sync with the people like say the farmers bills now in case of simultaneous elections then uh, then even if the protesters are agitating farmers are agitating then the government will not be bothered because elections will be after 5 years 
It will also help uh, keep the politicians in touch with the pulse of the public and the result of elections at various levels can ensure to the government the necessary course correction. In case any mistake is there on the part of the government, having you know many elections can help the government understand where its mistake is and it, can, it can help the government to change the mistakes that have been done by it. Also, when you have simultaneous elections, it will result in intertwining of national issues and state issues. And in these situations, actually, predominantly the national party is favoured. It is advantageous to the national party. Though, over uh, here it is written that it may give a boost to regional and local issues. Uh, please do understand that when both these issues are mixed together, it's usually the national issues which take a priority. It, it becomes easier for the national narrative to triumph. Okay. Now, also there is the biggest problem of logistics. How will you conduct elections for the entire country at the same time? Will there be enough security personnel? Will there be enough voting machines? Okay. Will there be enough uh, VV pads? You know, there won't be enough of anything. And that is a big problem. Now, Textile Ministry receives PLI applications from 67 firms. Now, we have spoken about this earlier also. What is Production Linked Incentive Scheme? Now, the Production Linked Incentive Scheme talks about specific incentives which, you know, companies or firms get based on incremental production that they are doing in the subsequent years, if at all as compared to 2019, if the company is producing more in 2020 then this company will get say 4% or 5% back in terms of rebate and hence this is profitable for the company uh, though it has to increase its production in order to benefit from this. Also these are the items which have been approved for this production linked incentive scheme in textiles. Okay, airbags, sanitary napkins, bandages track suits, coats, babies' garments, okay. Now, the textile ministry has received applications from as many as 67 companies to avail benefits of the production linked incentive scheme. Now, what is this PLI scheme? It covers, for, like what we spoke of, this PLI scheme for textiles. It covers about 40 man-made fibers, 14 man-made fiber fabric goods, okay. So this is 40 man-made fiber garment items. These are clothings while these are goods, 14 man-made fiber fabric goods and 10 technical textile products. So these are technical textile products. And this is nothing but the 40 plus 14 man-made fiber goods and textiles, goods and uh, garments. Okay. Now the government had approved the PLI scheme worth 10,000 crores for the sector with an aim to boost the domestic manufacturing and create jobs and promote exports. Why? Because when a company decides to increase its output, it has to have a higher investment. It will put in more investment, like say it will invest about say 300 to 400 crores in the plant machinery. Because this incentive is given only on incremental production. It is not given on the production that exists. So every company will have to either increase employment or it will have to increase the machinery so in any way, it will lead to growth and it will lead to development. Okay, the scheme aims to give companies incentives on incremental sales from products manufactured in domestic units. Incentives will be given to eligible producers in two phases. Now, uh, in the first phase, any person or company willing to invest a minimum of 300 crores. Remember the capital investment that we spoke of just now? 300 crores in either the plant or the machinery or the equipment and the civil works excluding land and administrative building cost to produce products of MMF fabrics. Man, uh, we just spoke of this man-made fiber fabrics, garments, 
and products of technical textiles these technical textiles also we just saw baby clothes uh, band-aids sanitary pads uh, airbags etc and then uh, okay these uh, entities are eligible to participate in the second uh, phase we have investors who are willing to spend a minimum of 100 crore rupees under the same conditions as mmf goods and technical textiles so this is for 300 crores and this is for 100 crores the kind of benefits that they will get will differ the scheme aims to attract fresh investment of around 19,000 crores in the sector for production of in-demand textiles and an additional turnover of 3 lakh crores over the next 5 years. Now, we have this PLF, PLI scheme for other sectors also. We have it in pharma, recently it was introduced. We have it in IT, hardware. We have it in electronics. PLI scheme for electronics, we have PLI scheme for food processing, we also have PLI scheme for chemicals. So please read which are the factors for which the PLI scheme has offered and what is the specific important thing about these schemes. Okay, now uh, this uh, entire scheme PLI scheme in textiles, it is also expected to create more than, uh, you know, 7 lakh new jobs in the sector. See, look at the numbers, an additional turnover of around 3 lakh crores and an additional employment of around 7 lakh people. So, it is a very beneficial scheme. Okay, next, moving on, most favored nation tag. This was in the news uh, very much during the year the Balakot strikes happened because India had also revoked the most favored nation status to Pakistan. Now, what is this most favored nation status? According to the Article 1 of GATT, GATT is General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, it requires that every WTO member, World Trade Organization member, it requires every WTO member to accord MFN status to all the other member countries. So every WTO member, it has to give this MFN status to every other country. Now, MFN is nothing but when you are giving any particular uh, benefit to one country, you have to give the same benefits to all the other countries also. Okay. However, there are also some exceptions to this MFN status. Uh, okay. In proper academic language, MFN status is nothing but all of uh, WTO's 164 member countries have to commit to this MFN status and it means that treating other members equally so that they can all benefit from each other's lowest tariffs, highest import quotas and fewest trade barriers for goods and services. This will increase world trade. So whatever are the benefits that you are providing to one country have to be shared with all the other countries. And hence this particular name, this most favored nation you know, this is a misnomer. It is not what the name suggests. It is a different thing. It means that you give to everyone the same sort of benefits. You don't have any hatred towards any one particular country. However, you know, this particular principle of non-discrimination is known as most favored nation treatment. However, there exist some exceptions, such as when members strike bilateral trade agreements or when members offer developing countries special access to their markets so under this you have free trade agreements, comprehensive economic agreements, okay, uh, then common market status, uh, customs union status, all these are exceptions to this most favored nation tag. 
you need not give these these FTAs and all to every country. These can be exceptions to it. Now, why is this in the news? Uh, it is in the news because the United States, European Union, Britain, Canada and Japan are planning to revoke Russia's most favored nation status because of its invasion of Ukraine. Now, uh, if you see this infograph, it actually talks about what are the uh, impacts of removing of this MFN status. It will result in a rise in customs duties on goods coming in from Pakistan. Exports of materials like cotton and chemicals may stop. This may raise production costs for industries in Pakistan. Okay. Now, removal of MFN status. There is no formal procedure for suspending MFN treatment. And hence, it is not clear whether members are obliged, obliged to inform the WTO if, you, if they remove the MFN status. There exists no particular mechanism saying that, you know, this is how you can remove off MFN status. And hence, it is a very informal thing. Though Article 1 of GATT mentions most favored nation, still it is a very informal thing. And there is no clarity around its removal. Uh, this we discussed earlier. What does uh, losing MFN status mean? Revoking Russia's MFN status sends a strong signal that the United States and its Western allies do not consider Russia an economic partner in any way. But it does not change the conditions for trade. It doesn't mean that just because they have removed MFN, all of a sudden, all the trade with Russia will stop. It will only be affected in the sense that after removing the MFN status, only if the US government decides to increase the customs duties on uh, goods coming from Russia, uh, then it will be affected. Okay. Removing the MFN status in itself does not uh, cause any problems to trade. But once the MFN status is removed, it means that automatically these countries will make it more difficult to trade with them. It does formally allow the Western allies to increase import tariffs and impose quotas on Russian goods or even ban them and restrict services out of the country. They could also overlook Russia's intellectual property rights, which means that they'll allow for reverse engineering and violation of IPR norms. Okay, moving on. Registered vehicle scrapping facility. Okay, now why is this in the news? It's in the news because the Ministry of Road Transport and Highways has issued the draft notification pertaining to motor vehicles uh, rules. There's an amendment. It was, uh, for the first time, it was drafted in 2021, I believe the motor vehicles uh, rules and this is the 2022 amendment. The formal name of the amendment is this motor vehicles registration and functions of vehicle scrapping facility amendment rules 2022. Now these amendments have been done in order to simplify and digitize the entire process of vehicle scrapping for all stakeholders in the ecosystem such as vehicle owners uh, and then the RVSV operators. Now what is this RVSV? Uh, RVSF, we just spoke about it, Registered Vehicle Scrapping Facility. It is the official place where old vehicles are scrapped. Dealers, regional transport authorities. Thus, in order to make it more simpler for scrapping to happen, these amendments have been brought in. Okay. Now, what are the amendments? The amendments provide a provision for vehicle owners to apply digitally for vehicle scrapping. All applications for vehicle scrapping must be submitted digitally only. The RBSF will act as a facilitation center to help vehicle owners apply digitally to scrap their vehicles. So you can go to the RBSF and you can digitally apply for uh, vehicle scrapping. It is entirely digital. There is no manual uh, or there is no paperwork around it. Necessary checks have to be done from the Vahan database before the submission of this scrapping okay so necessary checks have to be done from the Vahan database before submission of the application by the vehicle owner have been specified now why should these checks be done what if the vehicle is a, a stolen property or what if the vehicle has some criminal cases against it used in something illegal in that case you know a lot of these people can take it and then get it scrapped off and hence to prevent all these from happening before any vehicle is going in for scrapping, uh, there is a need to uh, officially get approval from the Vahan database. Now, what are the checks that happen when a vehicle goes for scrapping? 
okay there is a surrender of the higher purchase uh, agreement lease or hypothetic hy hypothetication agreement of the vehicle okay there has to be no criminal record against the vehicle in the ncrb bureau there has to be no pending dues on the vehicle no record of blacklisting of the vehicle by the regional transport authorities application for vehicles failing any of these checks shall not be permitted so any of the vehicles which do not follow any of these uh, entities will not be allowed to get scrapped also apart from all of this the other amendments are that there is an introduction of undertaking by the vehicle owner and the rvsf operators at the time of vehicle submission to ensure that there is transparency in the responsibility of the vehicle before and after su submission for scrapping people have to give undertaking saying that i was the one who was responsible for scrapping this vehicle also there is inclusion of more details in the certificate of deposit pertaining to the vehicle submitted for scrapping to enable transparency and trading of the said certificate of this certificate certificate of deposit okay this said certificate will be available to the vehicle owners digitally and shall be valid for a period of 2 years now what is the certificate of deposit using the certificate of deposit maybe the government can introduce some policy where the certificate of deposit will reduce the registration charges if at all you buy a new vehicle okay uh, so all those people uh, who can, who hold a certificate of deposit might not have to pay the registration charges or they might not have to pay some of the taxes using the certificate of deposit hence these certificates will be valid for a period of 2 years and they will be given okay now introduction of transfer certificate of deposit to ensure that consumers obtaining the certificate of deposit through electronic trading have a digital proof of the transaction okay now so have you i hope you understood what the certificate of deposit is it's it's just a proof that you have given the vehicle for scrapping and it will help you ensure that you get some other benefits out of this now what is this vehicle scrappage policy okay on the broad level vehicle scrappage policy was introduced in order to take these old vehicles out of the indian roads that will actually reduce the pollution it can create more employment it can also create more support for industries uh, all sorts of things now now uh, what are the provisions of this vehicle scrappage policy old vehicles will have to pass a fitness test before their re-registration and as per the policy government commercial vehicles which are more than 15 years old and private vehicles which are over 20 years old will be scrapped in case they don't pass this fitness test okay in case they pass the fitness test then they can be allowed for re-registration so all vehicles which are uh, over 20 years old uh, private vehicles and uh, government vehicles which are over 15 years old they have to be necessarily uh, uh, they have to go for the fitness test also this uh, re-registration fees will also be high it will be increased and would be applicable for vehicles which are 15 years or older like what we spoke of old vehicles will be tested at the automated fitness center and the fitness test of the vehicles will be conducted according to international standards okay what will be checked in this test the emission test will happen the braking system will be checked the safety components will be tested and the vehicles which fail in the fitness test will be scrapped like what we spoke of the ministry has also issued rules for registration procedure for scrapping facilities their powers and scrapping procedure that has to be followed it is a properly regulated industry from now on this was actually introduced within the budget itself for 2021 22 and it is believed that it will cover around 51 lakh around 51 lakh light motor vehicles which are above 20 years of age and other 34 lakh light motor vehicles which are over 15 years of age so 51 lakh uh, light motor vehicles which are over the age of 20 years and 34 lakh light motor vehicles which are over the age of 15 years so that's a big number near about 1 crore vehicles will be covered under this even currently if it comes into play 
नेक्स्ट टॉपिक ऑफ डिस्कशन इंटरनेशनल आर्बिट्रेशन एंड मीडिएशन सेंटर Why is it in the news? Because the Chief Justice of India has laid the foundation stone for the construction of the International Arbitration Centre in Hyderabad. The centre could be on the lines of the Singapore International Arbitration Centre or the London Arbitration Centre. What is alternate dispute redressal mechanism? Arbitration is one of the methods of alternate dispute redressal. Now. Okay, going through the courts, going through the subordinate judiciary, and going through the higher judiciary, this is a very, it's a, it's a very difficult task because of the number of cases which are pending, which are more than three crore in number, and hence, in order to prevent this. Okay, in order to prevent this logjam, in order to prevent this uh, clutter of cases, we have this thing called the alternate dispute redressal mechanism. Okay, now arbitration and conciliation are modes of alternate dispute redressal mechanism in which the disputes are settled without any litigation at the courts. Okay, alternate dispute redressal mechanism facilitate parties. to deal with the underlying issues in dispute in a more cost effective manner with increased efficacy okay they get their cases solved earlier also their cases will be cheaper because you know how it works in india the lawyers charge an exp- very high amount of money and not everyone gets justice and also cases go on for several years and hence no one is benefited now what are the other things under this alternate dispute redressal mechanism adr comprises mainly of arbitration mediation and reconciliation arbitration mediation and reconciliation now arbitration is nothing but when the dispute is submitted to an arbitral tribunal which makes a decision so there is a tribunal there is actually people judges there are three people who will sit over here and this tribunal will go into the facts of the case okay but this has to be done voluntarily these parties have to approach this tribunal this arbitral tribunal uh, voluntarily uh and whatever is the award that the tribunal has given it is binding on the parties mostly it is less formal than a trial and the rules of evidence are often relaxed it does not need to follow the strict rules of crpc or a cpc okay however there is no right to appeal on an arbitral award usually because it is binding okay there is no right to appeal now what is conciliation okay now arbitration we saw you have a tribunal and then this tribunal will give now in a conciliation it is a non binding procedure remember unlike this which is usually binding this is a non binding uh, procedure where an impartial third party who is a person called as the conciliator he assists these parties to a dispute in reaching a mutually satisfactory agreement conciliation is a less formal form of arbitration okay the parties are free to accept or reject the recommendations of the conciliator it is one person he gives us award after listening to whatever happens even this has to be voluntarily but over here usually it is not binding and these are you can go and appeal these decisions next mediation in the case of mediation like the name itself suggests there is one party who is talking to there is one person who is talking to both the parties who are in the middle of a litigation party 1 and party 2 okay party 1 and party 2 this uh, judge he looks into both of these and then he acts as a person who can talk uh, between both the parties because these parties might not be seeing eye to eye they might have a lot of problems between each other and hence this one will talk to both the parties and ensure that the dispute is solved very amicably okay now you saw the difference between all the three forms okay next employees provident fund organization interest rates recently the employees provident fund interest rates have been uh, reduced they have been reduced from around 8.5% to 8.1% 
Why? Because the banks have actually, the RBI has cut down on the interest rates in the banks. Now the repo rate has been reduced. It is around, I believe, around 4% or even lesser than that, which is very low. And because these interest rates have been reduced, even employee provident fund organizations' interest rates have been getting reduced. Uh, now, why is it in the news? The Union Minister for Labor and Employment announced the employees' provident fund organizations' interest rates for the year 2021-22. The return on workers' retirement saving funds parked with the employees' provident fund organization has been slashed to 8.1% from the existing 8.5%. Okay, the last time that the EPF savings were paid uh, an annual return this low was back in 1977-78. This 8.1% which is a very low number was last paid only in 1977-78. Now what is this employee provident fund organization? It is a government organization that manages provident fund and pension accounts of member employees and implements the employees provident fund and miscellaneous provisions act. So usually people who are employees okay uh, normally all those people who are drawing a basic wage of at least rupees 15000 or more okay they have to apply for provident fund now when they apply for provident fund both employer and employee contribute around 12% of the employee's monthly salary and this monthly salary includes both the basic wages plus the day earners allowance it includes both the basic wage and the dearness allowance. So the employee and the employer, they contribute 12% each of this. So how much is contributed? Around 24% is contributed Okay, to the employee provident fund scheme. It's called employee provident fund on a monthly basis okay uh, uh, please uh, remember that however even when these people are contributing to uh, the employee provident fund the principal and the interest rates that exist are only returned upon retirement or death okay and a partial withdrawal of up to some X percentage, X is not very important, that's why I marked it as X percentage, is allowed for education, marriage, illness, and house construction. Okay. Uh, no. Okay. Now, even under the PM Atmanarbar Garib Kalyan package, the Labor Ministry allowed the EPFO subscribers to withdraw up to X percentage of the EPF fund to help workers during lockdown. Hence, uh, you know, the government actually, uh, you know, it went against this uh, convention that the principal and the interest, which are usually only returned after retirement or death, it was waived in order to provide a little bit percentage of this EPF fund to the work to the workers during the lockdown period in order to help them survive now uh, now what how is this uh, EPF controlled okay the act is actually the EPF the organization it's administered by a central board of trustees uh, please remember that this EPF is a statutory body and it was uh, created under this act which is known as the employees provident fund and miscellaneous provisions act under that, Section 5A is responsible for the creation of the EPF, EPFO. Okay, the Central Board of Trustees. Now, this is the body which is uh, responsible for taking the decisions where the EPFO has to invest this money that workers give or the employees give. Okay, now this uh, Central Board of Trustees is made up of uh, representatives from the government both the union government and the states who make up about 15 nominees and employers who are the industrialists who have 10 nominees and then employees or the workers who have 10 nominees hence it is represented from all the three perspectives they make policy decisions about where to invest money usually government usually they invest in government securities commercial bonds equity shares with minimum and maximum slabs and they decide how much interest should be paid to subscribers. 
okay so it is the board that takes the decisions on where to invest and how to invest now moving on also please remember that uh, you know when it comes to provident fund there are two entities which you need to remember one is uan the other one is lin uan is known as the universal account number so when people actually deal with provident fund accounts this is the account uh, this is the number that is used and this labor lin is known as the labor inspection number so when employers are uploading documents onto this portal known as the shram suvidha portal for each uh, employee on shram suvidha portal then those employers have to use the la labor identification number uh, in order to upload any documents on the shram suvidha portal okay the employees provident fund and the miscellaneous provident fund act provides for the institution of provident funds for employees in factories and other establishments it is administered by the ministry of labor and employment it is also one of the world's largest social security organizations in terms of clientele and the volume of financial transactions which are undertaken moving on next topic fifth india canada ministerial dialogue on trade and investment now this topic is very self explanatory there is nothing specifically there for me to explain why it is why is it in the news it is in the news because uh, this particular ministerial dialogue uh, on trade and investment was attended to by the minister of commerce from india shri priyush goel and the trade minister from canada and the ministers they agreed to formally relaunch the negotiations for the india canada comprehensive economic partnership agreement sepa it is a form of free trade agreement comprehensive economic partnership agreement and also consider an interim agreement or early progress trade agreement like the kind that india had had wanted to sign with the european union okay like the kind that india has been trying to sign with uh, australia so this uh, this will be an interim agreement until the actual free trade agreement starts the interim agreement would include high level commitments in goods services rules rules of origin sanitary and phytosanitary measures technical barriers to trade and all the others also canada agreed to examine expeditiously the request for conformity verification body status to apeda apeda is agricultural and processed food exports development authority this is under the ministry of commerce please remember it is under the ministry of commerce It is not under the Ministry of Finance or any of the other bodies for facilitating Indian organic export products. Okay, when India, when APEDA will get this conformity verification body, it will be uh, able to send uh, organic product exports. Okay, also India Canada bilateral center will be set up for dedicated science and technology activities between the two countries. India has already established such. bilateral uh, centers with usa germany france etc okay now india canada relations please remember that canada hosts one of the in largest indian diasporas in the world there are about 1.6 million uh, persons of indian origin and nris which accounts for more than 3% of the total population of canada because canada's population is only around i believe around 30 million people okay out of that around 1.6 million are from india itself the, the diaspora has done very well in most of the sectors in canada in the field of politics in particular the present house of commons has 22 members of parliament of indian origin so that's a huge number out of 30 338 there are 22 members in terms of economic cooperation india and canada have trade worth about 6.3 billion dollars uh, though the trade is in favor of canada because canada exports to india about 4.5 billion dollars while india exports to canada only 2 billion dollars worth of goods and canadian pension funds have invested around 22 billion dollars in indian equity market capital market more than 400 canadian companies have a presence in india okay 
also indian companies in canada are uh, there in the fields of information technology software steel natural resources and india and canada like what we discussed they have been uh, discussing the comprehensive economic partnership agreement for a very long time apart from that there is energy cooperation there is also cooperation in science and technology it's very clear there is no nothing not to understand it's very straightforward please uh, read all these facts however there are problems in the relation there are big problems in the relation the biggest problem being that there is a sympathy towards khalistan i am sure uh, some of you might have read the flight kanishka blast that happened uh, which was caused by khalistani separatists now uh, canada has been a little soft on these khalistani separatists and they have a very anti india sentiment and hence that doesn't go well with india also canada's criticism of india's handling of caa protests farmer movement protests and all these things it pulls both the countries apart also the trade is not very big it is very small as compared to the economic sizes of both these countries canada's uh, gdp is around 1.7 trillion dollars while india's gdp is around 3 trillion dollars you know so obviously the trade has to be bigger because india has bigger trade even with usa and mexico but not with canada okay moving on strengthening of pharmaceutical industry scheme again this is a very straightforward scheme the ministry of chemicals and fertilizers has recently released the guidelines for strengthening of pharmaceutical industry scheme the scheme will extend support required to existing pharma clusters and micro small and medium enterprises across the entire country the objective of the scheme is to improve productivity quality and sustainability of the pharma companies and industries and it has a financial outlay of around 500 crores okay now what are the components under this uh, uh, scheme under this uh, strengthening of pharmaceutical industry scheme it has three sub components the so the umbrella scheme is known as strengthening of pharmaceutical industries while there are three sub schemes one two three the first scheme is known as assistance to pharmaceutical industry for common facilities program like the name suggests it aims to strengthen existing pharmaceutical clusters uh by creating common facilities support for clusters for the establishment of common facilities with a focus on research and development labs uh, testing laboratories effluent treatment plants etc is proposed under this particular component of the scheme you have common centers such as testing labs uh, developmental labs uh, effluent treatment labs etc then the second uh, sub scheme is the pharmaceutical technology upgradation assistance scheme which assists the msmes these are micro and small medium enterprises uh, for them support is proposed under the ptuas sub scheme through interest subvention of up to 5% per annum 6% in the case of units which are managed by scs and sts or through credit linked capital subsidy of 10% you can either get this or you can get this okay the third sub scheme is the pharmaceutical and medical devices promotion and development scheme to promote the growth and development of the pharmaceutical and medical devices sector through study uh, survey reports awareness programs database creation and industry promotion now knowledge and awareness through pharmaceutical and medtech industries will be promoted through this particular sub scheme what will be promoted knowledge and awareness regarding uh, medical technology regarding pharmaceutical industries so it's more of a awareness component moving on rashtriya raksha university prime minister narendra modi dedicated to the nation the building of rashtriya raksha university near gandhinagar now this is this university was also brought in through a act known as the raksha rashtriya raksha university act and this rashtriya raksha university is an institution of national importance uh, there are other institutes of national importance such as iisc such as some of the iits such as uh, jipmer you know all of these are institutes of national importance iams all of them and now even rashtriya raksha university is one of the institutions of national importance the university aims to become an academic research training ecosystem for national security and police so rashtriya raksha university 
is there for both academic purposes and for research and for training purposes for the police it endeavors its endeavors focus on highly professional national security police education research and training through its qualified civilian and security faculty both the civilian as well as the security faculty will exist and they will help in all these components security police education research training etc it provides instructions and research in police sciences including coastal policing and cyber security it also helps in establishing and maintaining colleges if colleges wants to if colleges want to have courses regarding security then the rashtriya raksha university will help in uh, maintaining them it will also be establishing colleges which will take care of these uh, things such as uh, education research training etc it also prescribes courses holding exams and granting degrees and other distinctions in all these components okay now it includes like what i said both coastal policing as well as cyber security and hence it's a very uh, huge uh, university yeah thank you